All right, what's up everybody? How's everyone doing? All right, I just want to start it off by asking who here is in a relationship? Go ahead and raise your hand and say, chee All right, so as some of you may know, I am happily now engaged to somebody. <laughs> And it's funny, the reason why I bring that up is because as I was praying about this message tonight, I was actually brought back to an argument that her and I had. How many of you guys ever had a crazy argument with your significant other? Let me hear you say, choo-hoo. That's everybody. So we were having a crazy argument. And how many of you guys ever heard them say, oh my gosh, you are so crazy. Have you realized that it's not about you? Not, oh, yes, amen, amen. And she said that to me, and I'm not going to lie, that hurt me, that hit me right in my heart, and I was like, oh, you're right, it's not about me. But why does this story stick out to me tonight is because I remember that actually in this book that Pastor Russell left on here, it's kind of God, in the Purpose Driven Life book, Pastor Rick Warren, in the first devotional, it says what? It's not about you, it's about God. And there is a quote that he says right here. It says, the purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. And there's one other person that actually explains this in an amazing way, and his name is the Apostle Paul. And he explains this concept perfectly as he writes to the Philippian church. And this is what he says. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, everyone say servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Let's pray. Father, we just want to pray that right now you just allow us to see that it's not about us, that our purpose and our calling and our destiny is actually meant to go beyond us. And we know that the meaningful life, finding meaning in the mess will only be found when we start looking at the fact that our world doesn't revolve around us, but it revolves around you. And God, we pray that you just prepare us for what you're going to speak. And I pray that you allow everyone to experience your presence and your power, because it's not just about hearing from a preacher, but it's about experiencing, experiencing the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit moving through this place. So God, we pray that you prepare our hearts. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, now what is Paul saying? That in order for us to truly find meaning in our lives, It will only come as we make a difference in the lives of others and realize it's not all about us. And that's why the title of my message for tonight is Making a Difference. Because we'll see that the meaning of our life will only be found when we start making a difference in the lives of others. And a meaningful life, which is my first point, is found when we move from a self-centered life to a Christ-centered life. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39, whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So it begins with humbling ourselves and knowing that we are not our own, but we have been bought at a price. How many of you guys have ever asked yourself, why am I here on this planet? Why am I sitting here in this room? Why am I here doing what I'm doing right now? And the reason why is because God is saying, I purpose for your life even beyond yourself. But that comes to the point where we have to realize that Our life doesn't revolve around ourselves, but it revolves around Christ. And there's a thing, difference between eternal significance and worldly significance. Eternal significance only comes through a relationship with Christ. And the difference between worldly significance and eternal significance is that worldly significance is selfish. Eternal significance is selfless. Worldly significance thinks about what I can get. 
Eternal significance is about what I can, what I can give. Eternal significance is also about, is also internal, while worldly significance is external. And outward appearance is important to the world. Inward transformation is important to Christ. And worldly significance is temporary. Eternal significance lasts forever. Or in other words, Forbes list without a loving family is nothing. How many guys ever wanted to be on the Forbes list? How many guys ever wanted to be in a mansion? But a mansion without meaning is nothing. The position without purpose is nothing. The likes without the faith is nothing. And the success without the significance is nothing. And the success without the Savior is nothing. And all the power in the world without his presence is, everyone say, nothing. Now, once we realize that, we must make the decision to fight that need to be self-centered and be Christ-centered. And we'll discover that we're all called to make a difference by being fishers of men. Everyone say fishers of men. And Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 20, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. I think we need to pause on that last sentence. What did they do? Immediately they left their nets. Why is that so significant? Because the nets represent their occupation or their job or their career that they were working for their entire life, and that's all they knew. But Jesus said, before you can follow me and become a fisher of men, I need you to let go of what you're holding on to that brings you security. So my question for all of you is, what is your net? What is the net? that God is asking you to let go of so that you can go into this new season being a fisher of men, making an impact and a difference in the world. Is it too much time on TikTok? Is it too much time on Instagram? Is it that desire and that need to get as many likes as you can, even realizing that the likes is temporary, but the love from God is eternal? Because, see, nothing is wrong. I mean, nothing is wrong with being a social influencer. I know a lot of us want to be that, and I think studies have shown that a lot of people in our generation wants to be a social influencer, but the platform is not to make yourself known, but the platform is to make God known. So if there's a purpose for the platform, then God will give you that platform. But if you keep on aiming for the platform, you're going to start doing things to get people to like you that never even liked you in the first place, and you're going to ask yourself, who am I truly? And the next net is this, a career you've chosen because other people told you that's what you should pursue. Whether if it's your parents, whether if it's your friends, whether if it's the world, whether it's culture, whether if it's society. And I'm not saying don't respect your parents. Submit to your parents, but remember that you're not living for your parents' approval. You're living for God's approval, and you're already approved. And then another one is too much time spent on Xbox, 2K, or watching anime. How many anime lovers do we have in here? How many of you guys ever watched that show or movie Demon Slayer? <laughs> My fiance made me watch the whole thing, and then I also had to watch the movie. And I'm not gonna lie, it was pretty good. It was pretty, it was pretty, pretty, pretty good. <laughs> Now, I'm not saying that any of these things are bad and that you should stop doing it fully, but sometimes it becomes a place where it distracts us from actually making an impact for the kingdom of God because it starts becoming an idol more than just something that God has given us because we're looking at the thing that God gave us instead of the one who actually gave it to us, amen? And then another one is this. Another net God might be asking you to let go of is a relationship you should have never been in in the first place. Because God is saying, I have my best for you, and you have what you think is best for yourself. Because, and it might even not, it might even be the right person, it just might be at the wrong time. Because the right thing at the wrong time is still the wrong what? Thing. But the right person at the right time is the right thing. And maybe that might be the one thing that's holding you back from making disciples and making a difference in the lives of others. And then the last net is the net of familiarity or the net of what you know. And God might be asking you to let go of what you think you know you should do 
so that you can follow the person that actually knows what you were called to do. Because it all comes down to following Jesus, but if you're holding on to the net so tightly, God, he's saying, I can't use you yet because you're still holding on to something that brings you a false security when I should be your security. And once we let go of our net, the next thing that Jesus says to his disciples, he says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority, everyone say authority, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. What is he saying here? That all authority has been given to Jesus, and he's the one who has complete authority in heaven and on earth. And when you step with him, he's with you always to the end of the age. And this, encap- and this encapsulates making disciples, which results in making a difference. Now, there are three ways we can make a difference. The first one is this. Use our gifts to bless others so that we can pave a way for the gospel to be shared. Everyone say gifts. What is a gift? A gift is something that's given to somebody else. A gift is not meant so you can comfort or Bless yourself. It's meant for others to give to, everyone say others. Others. So whether if your gift is organization, whether if your gift is your passion, whether if your gift is speaking, I know I got a big mouth and I realize that I used to use it for selfish and manipulative ways, but God said I'm going to transform it so you can impact the next generation. But some of you might have a different gift and a calling that God says, I want you to use it not for yourself, but I want you to use it for others. Because in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, it says this, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And, some, and the best place to begin using your gift would probably be here. Because if you can't use it here, it's going to be hard to do it out in the world. So if you're good, if you're very hospitable, then join the welcome team. If you're good at organizing and if you're good at administration, then go help out Alyssa and everybody else on that amazing, fantastic team. Can you just give it up for Alyssa and the entire Serve Tripod that's doing a fantastic job with our Serve teams? But see, the thing is, is that we don't do it because it's a good thing, but we do it because it's a God thing. And then the second one is this, sharing with others what Christ has done for us. The reason why I say that is because Pearlside Church is an amazing church where we actually help the community through food drives, electronics for education, all these other different things. But it's not just about doing good deeds, but it's about allowing the good deeds to open up a pathway so that they can come to know Jesus. Because there's a lot of, a char- there's a lot of charitable organizations that do a lot of good deeds, but without the gospel of Jesus Christ, then they will never experience the spiritual transformation that comes with knowing Jesus. So the reason why you serve your brother is so that they can come to know Jesus. The reason why you serve your sister is so they can come to know Jesus. You serve the person that is the hardest person to serve and love because you want them to know who? Jesus. And then once they come to that point where they're open to it, then you share it with them. What does that mean? We look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. What is a testimony? A testimony just means your story. It just means sharing with someone what God did when he came into your life, he transformed your life, and then now what he's doing in and through your life. Because see, the thing is that people can always debate the Bible. People can always debate theology, but nobody will ever debate what God has done in your life. Like for me, one example for me is I go up to somebody and I say, hey, God found me at a club in San Diego, Uber driver was a thug, and then he came into my life and he completely baptized me in his bathtub and I stopped drinking, smoking, womanizing, stopped being a manipulator, and God came and changed everything. Do you really think someone's going to say, nah, that didn't happen? Nah, what are you talking about? Now, man, you're still the same person that you were before. But it's because when we share our testimony, the Holy Spirit moves in such a way where it grips and softens their heart so that they can be more receptive to coming to know Jesus. Amen? And then the last one is this, teaching others to follow Christ themselves. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, it says, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. What does that mean? It means just walking with them and showing them how to follow Christ through your words and through the way you live your life. 
Now, taking these three points, I'm going to share an example, and I'm going to share a video in a bit of how all those three things came into play. Because last Sunday, I had the blessing and honor of actually baptizing my brother and his wife in their own bathtub via Zoom. Let's give God some praise for that. Now, how did that happen? First off, I used my gift of just sharing my testimony and my story with them when I first got saved, and I shared with them what God has been doing in my life and how I'm a completely different person. But then also when they finally gave their heart to Jesus Christ, they started following Jesus, and I was walking with them for about four years. And then it took four years to finally get them to the point where they said, I need to get baptized, I need to step in faith, and I need to stop making excuses. So go ahead and turn your eyes to the screen, and you go ahead and see this. So before we go ahead and get started, um, A.M. and Denise, do you have anything you'd like to share uh, before we proceed with the baptism? I want to just share the amount of control that I'm relinquishing to God and control and try to get myself to where I want to be. But this is the day where I'm deciding to let that go, um, to give God everything of me so that um, I can truly live for him. God, this is for you from this, this day on out. I've been sitting in darkness for maybe a year and a half, even after choosing to surrender my life to Christ. And um, I've been working through some hurts, deep hurts and deep traumas in my life. And today's the day I want to be able to let it all go, surrender it and step out in faith into the life that the Lord um, wants for me. I've been um, blocking the joy that the Lord gives and my soul is ready to receive that and, and embrace that new life. And so today is the day. Um, and today's the day. Today's the Praise day. God. All right. And I think Moana, do you guys have anything uh, you'd like to share? Thank you for inviting me to see this special day. As I was listening to both of you talk, mm -hmm. I'm crying in full of joy because I see I told Lexin that God was doing something in this family line from this generation down. Yeah. And with what's happening today, it's a continued confirmation of what God's doing in the Lomi Bao family and with my extended family as well. So we're praising God together of this new life in him. All right. <laughs> yeah. Warm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So at the den, then. So you're gonna go by. So you're gonna go behind him. Just have your hands ready behind his back, ready to dunk him. Okay. So what you're doing right now is you're choosing to commit your life to Christ. You're choosing to die to the old self and to live in the new. So, Am, are you ready? Yes. Okay, so we are going to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All right, Denise, go ahead and baptize him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Come on. There you are. Okay. All right. So, are you ready? Yes. Okay. All right, so, we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All right, and go ahead and baptize him. Yeah. <laughs> How do you guys love my dad's commentary? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so good, so good. And for some of you that are unaware, my parents actually got baptized in their bathtub um, uh, last year. And uh, it was through a COVID-19 pandemic where my mom literally almost was on the brink of death. And because of that, my dad was brought to the end of his rope. And as I went and I sacrificed and stepped in sacrificial obedience, God used me to share the gospel, to disciple him. But I, the reason why I bring that up is because you see that 
when one person is saved, God's desire and hope is for their entire household to be saved. And my belief for everyone sitting here right now, you guys are the next generation. You guys are the ones that are going to be the catalyst to your family that's going to break the generational curses that have been plaguing your family for generations and generations. Amen? But see, check this out. When they hit me up at 8 a.m. on Sunday, I was, it was Sunday. Sundays are busy. Sundays are stressful. Sundays are exhausting. And I literally could have said on that Sunday, I said, now nah, I'm too busy. Now nah, I'm tired. Now nah, my schedule is too packed. I don't think I can baptize you. But what I realized is at that moment, I had to pause and let the Holy Spirit move because I realized that hurry is the number one enemy to love. And hurry is the number one enemy to allowing God to use you to make a difference in the lives of others. Because I had to ask myself, what's more important, getting the task done or seeing my brother and his wife get baptized so they can come in their new life in Christ? So from that point, I realized that making a difference requires sacrificial obedience. And for those of you that read your Bible, you see, you would see that God looks at obedience over sacrifice, but not realizing that God, that with obedience, it will always require sacrifice. When you're saying yes to God, you're saying no to something else. When I said yes to baptizing my brother and his sister, I was saying no to rest. Because what I realized is that when God wants to use you to make a difference in the lives of somebody else, it's usually at a time that's the least convenient for you at the time where you're super tired, at the time where you feel like you don't got time, at the time where you feel like everything is just overwhelming, but that's why you have to lean into the Holy Spirit so that he can use you to bring the breakthrough, amen? And then in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 3, it says, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. So God calls us to obedience, but obedience does require sacrifice. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to share another story with you about someone who's actually sitting in the sanctuary tonight. And um, this guy, I definitely had to sacrifice a lot for when I had to step in obedience to uh, making disciples and being fishers of men. His name is Joel Punnaker. <laughs> Give it up for Joel. And then if you could go ahead and show the picture. So this picture was actually on September 11th, 2019. This was our first discipleship meeting. So the first time I saw him the week before it was at Starbucks, I remember I was sitting there and God put it on my heart to talk to this Indian handsome guy that was sitting next to me. And I said, no, I don't want to. He might not even be a Christian. And he pulls out a book about spiritual warfare. And I'm like, okay, he might be Buddhist or might be Islam or something else. But then I'm like, God, you got to give me another sign. And then God showed it to me by him pulling out a Bible. And I'm like, all right, well, I guess I have to talk to this guy. So I ended up saying, hey, man, how long, you, how long have you been following Christ? He kind of shared his story. I shared my story. I shared my testimony. And I said, hey, let's meet up the next week, and let's see what God wants to do in this discipleship relationship. And then we meet up. We have a great time. As you can see, he's smiling. I'm smiling. And then oh, maybe after that day, he kind of disappears. It's kind of like Casper. He's like a ghost because he ghosted me for about four weeks straight. And I was like, God, what am I supposed to do? This guy is completely ignoring my texts. He's ignoring my phone calls. He doesn't even answer any call that I give him. And God said, if I tell you to keep on reaching out to somebody, you do it because I told you to, not because of the result that comes from it. So what I ended up doing is I just ended up sending him, sending him a verse of the day every day for four weeks straight. How annoying is that? <laughs> And by the end of those four weeks, I'm at UH Manoa, and I was still doing campus ministry at the time before COVID-19 came. And I remember I was fasting and praying that, that day because it was Seek Week. And I remember when I was fasting and praying, I was actually sitting with another campus minister named Corey Ali Mazza, kind of by the Starbucks, kind of by that like recreational area. And I remember I was sitting down and guess who I see? Joel Panneker. And he walks up to me, he goes, bro, oh my gosh, for some reason I felt like today I needed to talk to you. And I'm like, okay, great. Well, it took you four weeks, but hey, man, that's awesome. But then because of that moment, because I stayed obedient to God and I didn't look at the results, I was able to actually see Joel Punnaker graduate and we're able to have this beautiful moment together. You can go ahead and show the next picture. And obviously you guys can see that's my beautiful fiance. <laughs> and that's two years later. And you can even show the next one. As you can see, we got ice in our veins. 
But because I stayed obedient to God, I was blessed enough to see the fact that he allowed me to actually make a disciple that is now leading, that is now on the worship team, that is leading a small group, that is pointing to other men. But if I focus on the result instead of focusing on my obedience, this moment would not have happened. So I share that with you because there are probably people in your life that God is still calling you to serve and you felt like you wanted to give up on. You probably got to a point where you said, this person is never going to give, give, give their life to Christ. This person is going to keep on ignoring me. This person is going to keep on dodging me. But God is saying, don't focus on the result, but focus on the obedience. And it is going to take sacrifice because I, at a point, I didn't want to text Joel anymore. It was probably by maybe the second day after he started ignoring me. <laughs> But it was only by the empowering of the Holy Spirit that I was able to stay consistent and determined to actually reach out to him. So we'll see. You'll see that. You'll notice that a lot of the opportunities we have to make a difference come at the times that are the least convenient. And then Hebrews chapter 13 verse 16 says this. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And we'll see that this should overflow from a heart of love. And as we'll see in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Because I'm not going to lie, there was a lot of times where I wanted to give up on this discipleship relationship with Joel, but every time I wanted to give up, God said, you love that guy. God said, you love this guy too much to give up on him. And I feel like the Holy Spirit is allowing all of us to even see a name or a face of somebody that we love right now. And God is saying, don't give up on that person because I never gave up on you. And that's why you're still sitting here tonight. And then there's another, there's a, there's a quote where it says, I love, the, I love the way Rick Warren describes this shift that happens in our hearts as we gaze upon the cross. The Holy Spirit presses us toward the realm of grace where we are transformed into seeing opportunities to love where others see wasteful sacrifice. Instead of the odor of waste, we learn to breathe deeply within God's bouquet of grace, where like Jesus, we are prepared for burial, ready to be crucified with Christ, so that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And then the last verse is John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Now, what does that mean? Is that means making a difference and making disciples and being a blessing to others is going to cost us. It's going to cost you something. Now, I want to give a preface before I show the last video, and it's about this guy named Desmond Doss. How many, how many of you guys have ever seen the movie Hacksaw Ridge? It's a very good movie, fantastic movie. If you haven't seen it, I would strongly encourage you to. But Private Desmond Doss was a conscientious objector who was a Seventh-day Adventist that decided to go into the military to be a part of the war of World War II. How crazy is that? You don't want to kill a conscientious, conscientious objector is someone who is refusing to carry a gun or a weapon. How does that make sense to carry a rifle into a battlefield where everybody's trying to shoot you? And what Desmond Doss had to go through was a lot of trial and tribulation and persecution because the soldiers didn't like the fact that he was trying to be different from everybody else. But because he stayed strong to his belief and his conviction, he was able to say this thing to this commander who asked him. He said, you know you're in battle. You know you're going to go into war. You know that a gun is necessary. But he said, this world is already torn enough apart. It's already torn apart enough. Is it bad to just maybe want to put a little piece of it back together by being a combat medic and healing instead of killing and restoring instead of breaking apart? So go ahead and take a look at this video as, uh, as you'll see what it means to live a life of sacrifice. Go ahead and take a look. Everyone,
Stein. I can't hear you. As you can see right there, the one thing he was asking the Lord was, help me get one more. Help me get one more person for Christ. Help me get one more person to save them. He had all this strength, but he never used it for himself. He used it for others. You all have gifts and talents. You guys all have this strength, but it's not meant to strengthen yourself, but it's meant to strengthen and also to impact and bless and serve others. And the generation that is here right now is a generation that could change everything in culture, in society, even in our country, and even in our nation. But it begins with us saying, we're not going to start thinking about ourselves anymore, but we're going to think about what God wants us to do. And that might mean God might lead you into the hellfire of battle. He went, into, he went into a place where every time he tried to save somebody, he put his life in danger where he could have got killed at that moment. Who does that remind you of? Of a man named Jesus Christ. A man who literally gave up his life so that our sins could be forgiven. A man who loved us so much where he said, even if they don't deserve it, I'm going to give up my life so that they can experience eternity in this world and in the next. And when we say that we are followers of Christ and that we're gonna make a difference, it's gonna mean that we're gonna need to sacrifice what we want for what God wants. To sacrifice what we feel like we need, to say, God, what do you need me to do? Because we're called to be blessings, not burdens.